from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. Today's podcast is our year in review special, so we're going to be changing things up a bit. We'll be breaking up the podcast into segments and hearing from a number of scholars from across MEI to get their take on the year's major events. We'll be starting with MEI President Paul Salem to discuss the big picture and U.S. policy towards the region. Paul, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Alistair, for having me. 2018 has undoubtedly been a challenging year for the Middle East. There are several ongoing civil wars, humanitarian and refugee crises, a broader regional proxy struggle, and the continuing surge of terrorism. Mm -hmm. Taking a macro view of the region, what in your estimation have been the most important developments this year and the main turning points? Well, I would say the region is still caught in a conflict trap uh, and a system which is in conflict with itself, which is really Iran on one side and a number of other countries, Arab and otherwise, on the other, including also Israel in a state of conflict with Iran, uh, and a, a regional order that does not exist. That creates sectarian tensions, it fuels terrorist groups, and it's also fueling several ongoing wars, uh, civil wars, primarily the ones in Syria and Yemen, and some instability in, in, in Iraq. There are also uh, regional discords, particularly in the Gulf uh, region, as well as conflicts between some of the Sunni states and Turkey that are fueling partly the conflict in Libya. Uh, so there's certainly a regional uh, uh, order problem in the Middle East, and there's also, I would say, a global problem in the Middle East that the Russia has returned. Uh, the U.S. and Russia don't have a clear roadmap as to where to go. China is emerging as a player. Uh, U.S. is either a little bit in retreat or is confused about its policy options, or at least people in the region are confused about reading the U.S. Uh, so there's confusion at that level, too. Uh, when you look a little bit uh, closer, you see that the Syria uh, civil war turned somewhat of a corner with the Assad regime uh, becoming more clearly victorious in the region, particularly uh, cleaning up, quote unquote, the regions around Damascus as well as the southwest. And there's the remaining pocket of uh, rebel fighters in Idlib. Of course, the U.S. remains in the northeast. But certainly the Assad regime turned a bit of a corner, and that war has wound down a little bit from the heights that it had seen in terms of destruction in previous years. On the other hand, the Yemen conflict, uh, uh, saw it's probably its worst year, uh, partly uh, uh, partly in terms of conflict, but certainly in terms of the humanitarian uh, crisis uh, that really escalated there. Uh, Libya, I would say, treaded water. It didn't get much worse or much better. A bit of hopes at the end of the year in November with the uh, attempt at a peace meeting in Palermo, Italy, and some promises of ongoing talks there, although, you know, no real breakthrough in that arena. And in Afghanistan, uh, also... Uh, more of the same, uh, none of it good, basically, a stalemate between... Kind of muddling through. Muddling through at some somewhat high cost, nothing like Yemen or Syria, uh, and the country remaining somewhat divided, and the year ending with sort of a U.S. attempt also to see if they can uh, broker talks uh, with the Taliban. Uh, and, you know, the biggest story in the region uh, was the crisis that MBS got into after the killing of, of Jamal Khashoggi that had impacts in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Uh, and has impacts in the region as well. Those impacts are probably still playing out, and we'll see in the weeks and months ahead how Saudi leadership either uh, reacts to this crisis, whether there's a minor reshuffling of leadership, not a replacement of MBS, but some adaptation to this crisis. Uh, all of that casts a very long shadow. Uh, and, of course, uh, in terms of Iran, uh, the U.S. withdrew from the nuclear deal, so Iran is a new period uh, of intense sanctions, reminiscent of uh, earlier sanctions uh, a few years ago. On the, on the issue of U.S. policy towards the, the region more broadly, how would you say that the Trump administration has fared this year? I, you refer to one of the major developments, the, uh, the kind of removal from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. But, but what else What else was uh, noteworthy to you? I think the Trump administration has not fared well, I would say. It has taken some major decisions. First to note on personnel, which are important, uh, this year saw, you know, a change of personnel. Uh, Secretary of State Tillerson was out, Pompeo was in, McMaster, National Security Advisor out, uh, John Bolton in, uh, John Kelly at the end of the year, Chief of Staff, uh, one of the last generals yeah, of the White House. Yeah, all the generals House's. seem to be out on the way out the door. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe more notably, uh, General Mattis, Department of Defense, has stayed. So that's been an element of uh, of stability. 
uh, Secretary of State Pompeo revived sort of a State Department presence and also brought, uh, along with President Trump's decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal, brought a, you know, consolidated, strong anti-Iran position across at least, this, you know, White House and, and State Department. But uh, the policy itself, which sort of pivoted on sanctions and pressure on Iran while partnering with Saudi Arabia and other allies, all, you know, was caught off guard, I guess, by the, uh, you know, unforeseen events with, with our friend Jamal Khashoggi that has put that, you know, leaning on Saudi Arabia and that alliance uh, in a bad light. And certainly thrown a, a kind of a monkey wrench in the works on the the, the push for the uh, the Arab NATO, the Middle East Strategic uh, Alliance initiative. Yeah, like certainly. That. And that doesn't seem to be uh, going anywhere. Uh, this, you know, the main policy development was the one on Iran. And I think... Uh, uh, the response from Iran has been muted in the sense that I think they're figuring just to hold on for the next two years and see if the Trump administration itself holds on. They're not about to uh, start negotiations, certainly not on the high terms set by Secretary Pompeo. And I think they figure that they can muddle through and they figure that they have uh, you know, a very strong position in Iraq, certainly in Syria, in Yemen, in Lebanon. Uh, so they're not losing. Uh, so if the policy from the Trump administration was to bring the Iranian government to its knees, uh, that is not happening. Uh, the Iranian economy is suffering, uh, but it doesn't seem at all to the le level which would cause a major change anytime soon in Iranian policy. Promises of a breakthrough in the Israel-Palestine peace process have only remained that. Uh, promises, so uh, no no real progress there. The peace plan is, is still yet to be released. It's still yet to be released, and 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 also there, the stumbling with Saudi Arabia makes that prospect weaker. Uh, it should be noted that the State Department appointed new envoys, so there's a bit more vigor. There's an envoy to Syria, an envoy to Afghanistan, an envoy to to the or leading somebody leading the Iran Action Group. So there's more maybe diplomatic activity, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, but no uh, real breakthroughs. On the other hand, I would say there's been no major crisis in the sense of, you know, no major terrorist attacks. Oil prices are okay. Uh, the U.S. forces have done well in defeating ISIS in Iraq and Syria. U.S. forces in Syria have not been attacked. And, and that is maybe the second noteworthy change in policy is that the Trump administration finally, towards the end of the year, clarified that it that it's staying in northeastern Syria until a number of conditions are met. That was rather vague uh, in the beginning of the year that became more clear. So I would say those are some of the highlights. And that, that remains a point of tension with Turkey, of course, as well. Oh, absolutely. After and that's an arena, you know, relations with Turkey. Also, there were hopes, promises that there may have been breakthroughs there. There was some glimmers, glimmers of hope after the Khashoggi incident when the U.S. pastor was released and maybe Turkey was making a play to, you know, use that to improve its relations uh, uh, with the U.S. But the U.S. commitment to stay with the Kurds in northeastern Syria is really the main stumbling block, as well as the presence of Mr. Gulen in the U.S. and some court cases in New York. So relations are as bad probably at the end of the year as they were at the beginning. But and Turkey moving closer to Russia, but not going for a full break with the U.S., certainly not. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. We're going to we're gonna leave it there, but thank you very much for joining thank the you, podcast Alistair. today. And uh, greetings to all our listeners for 2018. Next up on the podcast is Jerry Firestein. Jerry is MEI's Senior Vice President. Thank you for joining me today, Jerry. Delighted to be here. Thanks, Alistair. So 2018 was certainly an eventful year on the Arabian Peninsula. The GCC remains divided by the dispute between Qatar and the members of the so-called uh, anti-terror quartet. U.S.-Saudi relations have been strained following the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and the conflict and humanitarian crisis in Yemen continues unabated. What do you see as the main turning points and takeaways from the Arabian Peninsula this year? Well, I would say that uh, that clearly the, the issue that has garnered the most attention is the question about Mohammed bin Salman's leadership inside of Saudi Arabia. What does that mean domestically for the Saudis going forward, as well as what is the impact in terms of Saudi Arabia's international standing, its relationships, not only with the United States, but also with uh, its key Western allies. In addition to the uh, furor uh, over the Khashoggi uh, murder, 
Uh, we also have uh, the, I think, what most people saw as a rather bizarre uh, Saudi reaction to uh, a perceived Canadian slight and, uh, and an extremely hostile uh, response. Uh, and so I think that at the end of the day, where you had had a kind of uh, willingness to suspend judgment on Mohammed bin Salman, to give him the benefit of the doubt, to look at some of the good things he's doing, as well as the areas where there's concern about his instincts and his policies. Uh, all of these uh, events over the course of the year, I think, really left people, uh, certainly the broader public, the media, but also in Congress, uh, more or less convinced that Mohammed bin Salman uh, was a threat to regional security and stability, and a threat as well to uh, the stability of the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Yeah, the narrative in Washington seems to have changed pretty sharply, pretty fast on, on that front. I wanted to ask on the domestic front within Saudi Arabia, where does where does uh, the Crown Prince stand in terms of the, the, the reform efforts, the economic diversification efforts? Is that all kind of on ice for now? Or Well, I, I, I think, and, and of course, the, the Saudi intent is is uh, to go forward as as laid out in Vision 2030 and uh, and some of these others. But, you know, on the economic side, of course, we also saw the Saudis retreating uh, from what had been one of the key pillars of Vision 2030, which was the uh, the floating of an Aramco IPO. They backed away from that. Uh, I think that more broadly, there hasn't been very much progress on some of the economic initiatives that they wanted to, uh, to take. Uh, and, of course, the soft oil prices have made their uh, economic situation a little bit more complex. Towards the end of the year, of course, we've seen a little bit of an uptick decision in uh, OPEC uh, uh, in December to take uh, 1.2 million barrels uh, off the market every day should help at least firm up uh, the price and maybe bring it back into a, a better range for the oil producers. But nevertheless, this has not been a, a particularly a wonderful year for the Saudi economy either. Certainly. Um, on the GCC front, the economic and diplomatic blockade of Qatar is a year and a half old now. Uh, has any progress been made on that front over the course of this year? And what impact has it had on the kind of role and relevance of the GCC more broadly? Well, I, I think, uh, um, you know, we saw, of course, in, uh, in the December uh, GCC summit in Riyadh, uh, what seems to be a hardening of positions, uh, really no movement. There had been some hope, maybe it was a little bit uh, uh, overly optimistic, but there had been some hope that perhaps uh, Sheikh Tamim, the emir of Qatar, would uh, come to Riyadh and that there would be an opportunity uh, perhaps to begin to work through uh, this, uh, this boycott that, uh, as you said, began in uh, June of 2017. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, most people recognized uh, or came to the conclusion that indeed uh, we are probably in a frozen conflict for the foreseeable future in terms of the ability of the GCC to function at a higher political or security level. Now, the, the good news, I think, on the GCC front is that uh, that uh, in, intra-GCC dispute doesn't seem to have resulted in an, in an inability of the parties to work together on some of the fundamental areas of cooperation on the economy, on, uh, they, on foreign policy. They issued a statement that reiterated uh, that all of the uh, six parties to the GCC agreed on some basic elements. So the GCC continues to function. Uh, it continues to move forward in, uh, in areas where there can be consensus. Uh, and uh, I think that there seems to be a general view that they're going to set aside the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. which is the uh, the uh, guttery uh, dispute with Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain, and uh, move forward. So reports of its death are greatly exaggerated. Yeah, I don't think it's going to die, but uh, but it certainly isn't going to thrive either. And that, of course, has implications for the U.S. administration, particularly in terms of their continued interest in moving forward with the Middle East Strategic Alliance, the so-called Arab NATO. Uh, and that, uh, uh, despite the fact that we continue to hear that the administration is committed to it, um, doesn't seem likely to move forward very much. 
I wanted to shift gears and touch on Yemen as well. It remains the world's worst humanitarian crisis, issues with fighting, with with cholera, with famine. How has that situation changed over the course of the year, and uh, what are the U.S. and kind of international community doing about it? Well, uh, you know, as we come to the end of the year, of course, there's a little bit of a, of a bright spot, a little bit of optimism. Uh, Antonio Gutierrez uh, has announced now that uh, that there seems to be uh, at least the framework of an agreement on Hodeida, uh, including uh, the withdrawal of, uh, of troops uh, and a ceasefire. Uh, there seems to be, uh, as well, a willingness to meet again early in 2019. So, um, you know, too early, I, I certainly don't think that it's time to break out the champagne. And we'll see whether uh, the, uh, the agreements on, for example, prisoner exchanges actually get implemented. Uh, we've been uh, in a situation where we've had agreements before, but they are all... Uh, die as soon as the ink is dry. So we'll hold in abeyance our our conclusions, but it does seem as though the parties uh, have uh, uh, come to the conclusion that they should try to move forward on a political track. That, of course, comes at the end of you know what has been a very difficult year for Yemen on the humanitarian front, on the military front, uh, a number of, uh, of incidents, a lot of concern in the international community about uh, particularly uh, the threat of mass casualties and uh, widespread destruction if there was a military push into into Hodeida to try to take the port. So if that's resolved, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, the, uh, the Swiss and the Swedes uh, have indicated that they are going to convoke the international community to try to uh, to raise, uh, they said, $4 billion for humanitarian relief for Yemen. Uh, that uh, will be obviously a positive development. Uh, but I think that there needs to be more long-term engagement on the part of the international community, both to support what Martin Griffiths is doing uh, um, with the UN uh, role, as well as to lay out a, uh, a roadmap for not only humanitarian relief, but also for the long-term reconstruction and redevelopment in Yemen in a post-conflict situation. We're going to be getting into uh, where things are headed in 2019 in our next podcast, but we'll leave it there for now. Thank you again for joining us today, Jerry. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Alistair. I'm very happy to welcome Alex Vitanka. Alex is a senior fellow here at MEI. Thank you for joining, Alex. Thank you. 2018 has undoubtedly been a challenging year for Iran, from protests and economic issues to the U.S. withdrawal from the nuclear deal and the subsequent reimposition of sanctions. As a seasoned Iran watcher, how did 2018 look to you? Well, I think uh, it looked certainly terrible from the perspective of President Hassan Rouhani. I think he was supposed to have really delivered on the um, on the aftermath of the nuclear deal, which was supposed to be nothing but a long list of good things happening to Iran, primarily focused on fixing Iranian economy, uh, as it has had for a number of years quite deep uh, problems to, to tackle. But the May 2018 decision by the Trump administration f walking away from that nuclear deal and reimposing American sanctions, n not just uh, reimposing American sanctions, but asking everybody else in the world to come along with the U.S. on that, on that policy really put the Rouhani administration in an awkward place. So what they have done since is to sort of try and make sure they can mitigate, limit the damage. The damage is being done. Everybody in Tehran accepts that the economy is going to hurt, that it's going to cost Iran dearly. But what they've opted to do for now is wait and see. Basically, I think what they're trying to hope might happen is that the presidency of Donald Trump would be four years long, not eight years long. And then they can go back to whoever takes over in the White House and go back to the nuclear deal, maybe re make some readjustments, but at least go back and talk to the Americans again after Trump leaves the White House. Do you think wait and see is a, is a kind of viable strategy for them at this point, though? No, I think what they're doing is delaying the, the basically inevitable, which is to have the need to talk to the United States. You know, the Iranian-American problems didn't start in the year Trump took over as president. They go back to 1979. They need to have a generational uh, mindset change, if you will. I mean, the older first uh, first generation revolutionaries in Iran are 
either dead or dying. And I think what they owe the younger generation of Iranians is to say, look, this is what we did back in 1979. Over the last 40 years, we've been paying the price by not having sort of a working relationship with the Americans. But we're not going to pass this on to you, the generation that comes after us. That would be the wise thing to do, I think. Uh, We're not there yet. This Iranian supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, is not interested in that. Uh, but I think folks like Hassan Rouhani and uh, so-called moderates might be open to that idea because, you know, frankly, some of the s- most serious problems the Iranian economy suffers from, such as corruption, lack of transparency, structural need for change, uh, they have nothing to do with Trump or the United States. They're all internally um, shaped by the political system that Iran has put together, which is unique and extremely convoluted and not very good for for the economy. These are things that they need to do in Iran. They can't blame that on Trump, United States, or anyone else. And Rani was elected in, in part on a platform saying that he would address some of those issues, but from, it sounds like from what you're saying that he hasn't been very successful in managing to do that. Why is that? Basically, what I think he wanted to do was to sort of have those sanctions removed, have foreign companies come in and invest in you know, billions of dollars, create jobs, and become the hero of the day. Didn't work out that way. And, and frankly, some of that hope for large-scale investment didn't even become topical before Trump uh, announced that he was walking away from the deal because investors from outside went to Iran. So great opportunities. This is a huge market. You can make a good amount of money in Iran. But the problem is you always wonder who runs the show in Iran because there is one government uh, of elected officials dealing with another state within the state of unelected officials. And that is always an obstacle in the path of not just foreign investors, but also domestic investors. Rouhani never really tackled this issue. Rouhani never really had the political confidence in himself, uh, in his mission, to stand up and say, I'm going to be a game changer. Instead, he plays on the margins. I wanted to ask about uh, sanctions specifically as well. How much of those uh, kind of biting uh, at this point, given the the waivers that the, the Trump administration issued? So, I mean, if you want to focus on oil, which is certainly the one most people keep an eye on, although the Iranian economy isn't solely reliant on oil exports, but it's a big part of their budget. Um, on this next year's budget, that would be March 2019 to March 2020, um, they are planning to sell about 1.5 million barrels of oil a day at about $54 a barrel. Now, the before sanctions, Iran was selling or exporting about 2.5 million. So that's a net loss of a million dollars a day. But they're happy to take that as a loss, as long as that means they don't have to talk to Donald Trump, which in my view is extremely short-sighted, creates uh, nothing but more damage to the Iranian economy. And they still haven't figured out, even if Trump leaves uh, once his first term is over, how are they going to talk to his successor? Where is that policy blueprint? It's certainly not in the pipelines. I wanted to close with just a question on uh, Iranian foreign policy. With the conflict in Syria now winding down, is Tehran scaling back its commitment there? And what are its priorities in terms of uh, its proxies in the region? Depends who you ask. I think you have to talk to some of the so-called moderates in the Iranian regime. They want to see a far less of an involvement in places like Syria, certainly more far away places like Yemen. They don't see the return on the investment. And they want to focus on the economy at home. They think that's the future for the Islamic Republic to survive by creating jobs for Iranians in Iran as opposed to running around and and paying um, the bills for proxies in places like Syria and Yemen and so forth. But there's, as I said, there's another side to this Iranian regime. The Revolutionary Guards is the one that is most relevant in the context of Iran's foreign policy conduct. They know nothing but running around the region and waging sort of um, the fight against what they call imperialist powers or anti-Iran, anti-Shia, anti-Islamic forces. Uh, And I think, you know, at this moment, I don't see any sign that the elected governments, be it Rouhani today or the next one who will follow after him, will be in a position to change the course unless the Revolution Guards generals themselves come to the conclusion that the path they're on is not sustainable, that this is a case of overreach, spending money abroad that could and should be spent at home, because if they don't, Iran might easily end up with another revolution on its hands, as they had in 1979, or as neighboring Arab countries have experienced in 2011 and onwards in the so-called wave of Arab Springs. So... 
It's a debate for them to figure out between the Revolutionary Guards, the hardliners, and the elected officials. But it is an extremely important decision they have to make, what they want to be, a nation state or a revolution. I think it's very clear on the data and evidence that people of Iran want to live in a normal country uh, where their practical needs are put first, as opposed to chasing, you know, pipe dreams of changing the global order, which is the agenda of the revolutionaries. Uh, but we have to wait and see who, who might uh, make inroads in that battle in, in next year. Great. Well, I think we'll have to leave it there. Alex Otanka, thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to welcome Gunul Toll to the podcast. Gunul heads up MEI's Turkey program. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I think it's fair to say that 2018 has been a turbulent year for Turkey and for Turkish-U.S. relations. Uh, the country is facing significant political, economic, and foreign policy challenges. Looking over the, the course of the year, what's your, what's your take on 2018? Well, I think the most significant development um, for the country was the, the currency crisis in, in the summer. Um, Turkish currency fell nearly 40 percent against uh, the U.S. dollar since the start of the year. Uh, Double-digit inflation has sent prices of uh, food, energy, and other goods uh, soaring, uh, and domestic salaries. Um, they uh, have not kept up with the hike in inflation, so the cost of living um, rose. Unemployment has been rising. So uh, I think the crisis was the, the result of years of mismanagement, um, large government deficits and governments encouraging private firms to borrow in international markets. Uh, so investors are now worried that, that, that Turkey will not be able to repay um, the loans. So as investors were worrying about these, uh, they faced a, an, an even bigger crisis when the, the U.S. administration um, decided to slap sanctions uh, against two Turkish officials after Turkey failed to release an American pastor who was jailed in Turkey for, for two years on, on terrorism charges. Uh, and also Trump doubled uh, tariffs on, on U.S. imports of Turkey steel and aluminum, which um, I think uh, the U.S. sanctions not only exacerbated the, the currency crisis, but also brought the bilateral uh, relations between the two countries to an all-time low. Worth pointing out here that Turkey is a major exporter of steel as well. That's that's right. Um, but I think I, I would argue that something good came out of uh, Turkey-US tension. Uh, Turkey finally released Andrew Brunson, uh, and that cleared the air between President Trump and, and President Erdogan. But Turkey recently threatened uh, to launch a military attack uh, against incursion against um, the, the Syrian Kurdish militia targets who have been close U.S. partners, uh, Erdogan threatened to launch the incursion into eastern Euphrates, something that he has been reluctant to do so until until very recently. So we are uh, nowhere close to uh, getting back to uh, strong U.S.-Turkey ties. Uh, and also, I think, another uh, good outcome of both Turkey-U.S. tension and Turkey's economic uh, crisis was uh, Turkey's decision to mend ties with its its European partners. Um, I, they, European countries, key European countries such as Germany and the Netherlands, uh, they spent the year uh, 2017. Uh, Turkey, Germany, Turkey and the Netherlands, they spent 2017 pr pretty much disliking each other. But I think uh, these two developments forced Turkey to, to mend ties with these countries. Uh, President Erdogan paid a visit to Germany and, and praised uh, Turkey's partnership with Germany and encouraged closer ties with, with uh, European countries. So I think that was, a, that was a positive development, uh, and the, the, one of the main drivers was the, the Turkey's struggling economy and the problems Turkey was having with uh, with the United States. What are some of the other, I mean, you referenced the, the, the YPG issue in Syria and the kind of U.S. cooperation with the YPG. What are some of the other major issues in the, in the Turkish-U.S. Uh, relationship at the moment? Well, there's certainly the, the case of Fethullah Gülen, the Islamic preacher who has been living in Pennsylvania, and Turkey has been accusing him of orchestrating the failed coup in 2016. Uh, Turkey has been demanding his extradition, and American side is saying that, that they do not have uh, enough proof linking him to the coup attempt, so that's a major bone of contention. Uh, and there's also the Halkbank case. Uh, it's a state-owned uh, case that's currently facing charges, major charges from U.S. 
U.S. Treasury for violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. That's that's another important issue. And also, I think the, the Turkey's decision to buy Russian uh, def- missile defense system S-400 is uh, is is also a huge problem, uh, and I think as four hundreds will be delivered um, reportedly in the summer of two thousand nineteen, uh, and the Congress is is quite pissed about that. Um, so so those 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 are the main main problems facing Turkey U.S. ties. I wanted to ask about Russia as well, since Turkey seems to have gotten closer uh, to, to Russia this year, in particular in regards to to the missiles, but kind of more broadly as well as on the kind of cooperation front with with regards to Syria. Uh, what's your kind of read on that? I think 2018 was a good year for Turkey-Russia partnership. The t- Turkish-Russian cooperation in in Syria continued, and in fact, they the two signed a deal uh, on Idlib. Uh, so they decided, to, according to the deal, they decided to create a, a buffer zone, a demilitarized zone, uh, and Turkey was tasked with uh, basically rooting out the jihadists from 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 Idlib. Uh, so that is an important cooperation, uh, and in terms of energy cooperation. I think it's uh, Turkey, t- Turkey, uh, Russia cooperation is, is still very strong and it's it's deepening. Uh, President Putin was recently in Istanbul to celebrate the the uh, the end of the construction of the, the offshore segment of Turk Stream, which is a pipeline that is designed to carry Russian uh, energy to to Turkey and potentially to Europe. Uh, so, uh, 2018 was was a good year for for Turkey Russia relations. Great. And the last thing I want to ask about was uh, was uh, Iran in reference to uh, to Turkish relations with Iran as well. Well, Turkey is part of this this trilateral uh, arrangement in Syria, part of the one of the, uh, the Astana partners there. So Turkey is also working closely with Iran uh, in in Syria, and Turkey also has a, a very close energy and trade partnership with Iran. Uh, of course, the Trump administration's decision to reimpose Iran sanctions uh, was very problematic, uh, and Turkey repeatedly sa- said that it would not comply with the sanctions. Uh, but it recently it was granted a waiver. Um, but of course, it's uh, it's a short-term solution. After six months, the Trump administration will demand that Turkey uh, stop buying Iranian energy, and that's a very difficult decision for Turkey as a country that is very much energy uh, dependent, and and Iran plays a huge role there. Uh, th- that is a problem. Uh, but I think in terms of Turkey-Iran relations, um, uh, it's it's always been both very competitive. But on the other hand, neither country has so far um, wanted to alienate each other. So they managed to compartmentalize their, their relations despite policy differences. They work together and they will continue to do so. And I also would like to add one more thing. Uh, President Erdogan wrote an opinion piece for The New York Times. Um, he was referring to the fact that, that the tension between Turkey and the U.S. might force Turkey to seek out uh, new friends. And and China is potentially it's, it's, it's one of those friends and Turkey has been trying to cultivate closer ties. So the, the, the currency crisis in the summer, in a way, pushed Turkey Turkish government to to accelerate that that process. So Turkey is is now uh, within the framework of Silk and Road Initiative. Turkey is hoping to attract Chinese investment and uh, deepen its uh, trade and 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 also energy partnership with China. Great. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. Gunu Tol, director of MEI's Turkey program. Thank you very much for joining us on this special year-end podcast. Thank you. Next up, I'm delighted to welcome Ahmed Majidjar to discuss Afghanistan. Ahmed is a senior fellow at MEI and the director of our Iran Observe program. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. Ahmed, as a longtime watcher of Afghanistan, what's your take on this year's events, both domestically and in terms of Afghanistan's relations with the U.S. in particular? Well, this year we saw that security uh, certainly deteriorated throughout the country. The Trump administration's South Asia strategy uh, failed to produce tangible results. The new strategy had two key pillars. First, it was to intensify the military campaign uh, to weaken the Taliban militarily and force the insurgents to come to the negotiating table for a political end to the war. Uh, However, we saw that the Taliban captured more territory this year and also increased violence uh, throughout a a campaign of assassinations and also spectacular and suicide attacks across the country. Uh, And also they uh, have not uh, agreed to sit down with the Afghan government uh, to 
uh, negotiate peace. And the second pillar of the new strategy was to pressure uh, Pakistan to abandon its support for the Taliban. And on that front, also, we've not seen any uh, meaningful results. Seems like one of the biggest uh, developments this year has been the increasing international engagement with the Taliban. The, the Moscow talks in November, Chinese back-channel diplomacy, uh, the role of the new U.S. special representative, uh, Zalmay Halilzad, uh, trying to drum up kind of support for those those peace talks. Where does that process stand, and, and do you think a deal can be worked out? Absolutely, because we, we've seen that the talks with the Taliban have gained momentum. Uh, the Taliban representatives have had several rounds of talks with the senior U.S. representatives in Qatar. They've also uh, had talks with uh, Russian, Chinese, uh, and also uh, officials from Gulf regions about the prospects uh, of a political settlement to the war. But I think that it is premature to be realistic about uh, the success of these talks unless the Taliban agree to sit down with the Afghan government and directly uh, talk about peace. So far, we've seen that the Taliban are willing to talk with the Americans about the withdrawal of uh, foreign troops from the country, but they don't want to recognize the Afghan government, the Afghan constitution, and also negotiate with the, with the Kabul government about a power sharing agreement or about any peace proposals to end the war. I just wanted to ask you about uh, the kind of point of view of kind of the average person in, in Afghanistan in terms of the security situation, which you referenced earlier, in terms of, uh, of, of increasing Taliban control, but also the economy. Kind of from the point of view of an average person, how, does, how do they feel at the end of 2018 versus uh, a year ago? Well, this year we saw some uh, positive signs in the Afghan economy that the government managed to increase its revenue in the agriculture sector, in the uh, service sector, and also in collection of taxes and customs. Uh, however, uh, we are at a time that the international aid is declining, so the key challenge for the Afghan government remains a sustainable way of economic growth. Uh, and that remains uh, very difficult because the international uh, aid is declining. At the same time, corruption and security remains the uh, main hurdles. Significant political challenges then. Uh, on that front, um, President Ashraf Ghani was elected in 2014 and is now approaching the, the end of his term. Where does, that, uh, where does he kind of stand now after, after nearly five years in office? Uh, President Ghani has had mixed uh, records over the past four years. Uh, we've seen that he has uh, executed some reforms, uh, but at the same time, he has not been able to improve the security situation or also curb corruption, uh, which uh, is the main reason for the dis dissatisfaction of a majority of Afghan. He certainly wants to run for re-election, uh, but it is uh, too premature to uh, see whether he will win a second term or not, uh, because the opposition so far remains very uh, fractured, and there is no formidable uh, person to challenge him at this point. I wanted finally to ask you about the parliamentary elections that were held in October. It seems the results uh, aren't aren't clear still. What happened? When are we likely to to find out what happened there? And at this point, are they are they credible? Well, uh, uh, the result of the final results of the parliamentary elections are not announced yet. Uh, but in my opinion, the parliamentary elections uh, for Afghanistan standards. Uh, were uh, largely a success because despite the security hurdles, because of some irregularities, the elections did happen uh, throughout the country, uh, with the exception of only two provinces out of the 34 provinces. Uh, the Taliban failed to disrupt the elections and the Afghan people braved the Taliban threats and participated in the elections. We also saw a record number of women and young people participating in, in the elections uh, that has raised the hope amongst Afghan people that a young uh, new parliament uh, will bring some reforms that uh, their predecessors have failed to do. Great. We're going to leave it there. Ahmed, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure again. Thank you to all the MEI scholars who participated in this special year-end podcast, and thank you to our audience for listening today as well as throughout the year. We will see you in the new year with a look ahead to 2019. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.